Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dol Abramson, member of faculty here in the Graduate School of Education. I have the privilege and honor to introduce Dr. Maria Alessandra Mariotti of the University of Siena, Italy, where she's professor in the Department of Information Engineering and Mathematics Science. Prior to her current appointment, Professor Mariotti was for many years at the University of Pisa. Professor Mariotti is a world leader in the semiotic analysis of mathematics learning processes by semiotic, I'm referring to theories that approach learning through the lens of the various signs that we generate, adopt, and use in going about the business of doing what is called mathematics. These signs can live in various modalities and media, such as gesture through the air, perhaps towards something, or symbolic notation inscribed on paper. And perhaps Professor Mariotti's most celebrated uh, contributions are in articulating the role of the teacher in steering students who are working with pedagogical artifacts, be these concrete or virtual, to make mathematical sense of their own actions. So how do actions with objects become mathematically meaningful? Stay tuned and we might just find out uh, by listening to this talk. And I'll only add that Professor Mariotti has a long-standing relationship with our department. She's been visiting us periodically now for 20, many years. Many years. Many years. <laughs> and for sure my own lab has hugely benefited from her wisdom and charm. So please join me once again welcoming Professor Mariotti to the GSE. So thank you very much, Dora, for this introduction. And thank you for inviting me to present my, my work. I was very doubtful about what presenting. And uh, so uh, my decision was also, uh, in a sense, influenced by or affected by the fact that I didn't know very well to whom I was um, talking. So uh, I tried to find something that could be uh, understandable and also I hope uh, useful uh, not only for math educators but also for people that are not specifically in math education. Um, so thanks a lot. I hope to have a certain feedback about what I'm. Uh, I try to be interactive, but you know when you are not speaking in your native language, this interaction is not always so easy. So I try my best. Uh, so, what I will present you, I will present you something, a sort of model for teaching and learning using artifacts. This is a not a nice word, art. It's not mine. But um, as I try to explain later in a bit, but I, I, I don't have time to, uh, to uh, explain completely, uh, this is a, a word uh, used since some years in the field of mathematics education and mainly uh, in studies concerning the use of technologies. Um, so uh, I will try to explain how I intend that. Um, this model, which is ambitiously, <laughs> very, very too much ambitious to call it a theory, but it's not uh, our fault. At a certain point, people referring to our work. I will talk at plural because my work, what I present, is shared with a, a very a great friend and colleague of mine, Mariolina Bartolini Bussi. So uh, we were working on that. At a certain point, people were referring to our work and referring to our model, calling it theory. Uh, I'm a mathematician as a formation, so I'm very cautious to, to use the word theory. But uh, if you take it in, in a broad sense, this could be also a theory. It certainly expressed the intention to clarify as much as we can uh, our key ideas and how we use them both in the design of teaching experiments and in the analysis of the data that we collect from these teaching experiments. So what I will try to show you is uh, overview of this model and some evidences, some data analysis 
from a teaching experiment. I will try also to make some reflections uh, which are more methodological reflection about the tool of analysis that uh, I, that we uh, set up for our uh, studies and for our analysis of the data. Because I think this was a very mm, important uh, part of our work. Um, because I think that are, here there are some students, uh, I, I like the, to stress this aspect. Because when we want to, uh, to show something, the most difficult thing is exactly to find a good tool in order to uh, make something in evidence of what we want to, to show. Sometimes we are very much convinced that certain ideas are good, but it's difficult to show to the others. And to find good tools is always a very difficult. And because we were talking about science, and I will try to explain in what sense we, we use the word sign, it was very difficult to show how to talk about science, how to say something meaningful about education using science. So we try to elaborate a certain classification of science very specific for these specific uh, studies. Similarly, we wanted to show that the teacher was acting in a proactive way. Uh, sometimes, this, uh, uh, if we look at uh, previous studies, we find a lot of examples where the, the researcher present an, a short part of a, of a discussion or a short part of a dialogue and comments say, oh, it's clear that the teacher was proactive. It means that was the action of the teacher which caused, which originated a certain reaction in this but sometimes it's difficult to really understand which was the action. And uh, in, if you want to be, uh, let's say, also effective in the sense uh, we want to transfer, we want to make uh, use of our results, for instance, in the formation of the teacher, we have to be very careful in the description of these actions in order to make clear what a certain intervention of the teacher can be considered, when a certain intervention of the, of the teacher can be considered as an action with a certain goal, with a certain scope, and when this action has a certain uh, reaction from the, from, the, from the student. I don't know if it's clear, but I hope that the example will clarify. So, let's start. Artifacts and mathematics. So the study of educational potentialities of artifacts has become quite typical since new technologies and didactical software enter into the school. This doesn't mean that before there was no interest to uh, study the use of particular materials, didactical materials. But certainly, uh, since uh, new technologies enter on the scene, uh, we have a flourishing of studies about the potentialities of particular devices, particular artifacts. However, mathematics has always been connected with the use of artifacts. Since its very beginning, the history of mathematics has been intertwined with artifacts utilization. Many times we forget it, and mainly at school we forget it. And we forget the origin, the instrumental origin of mathematical ideas. Certainly, there is a lot of use of embodied artifacts, I like the, the example of uh, ants and figures, 
there is a lot of material artifacts, something which is done with a particular purpose. In the, in the image you, find, you see an uh, abacus of the Roman area. Uh, here is a, a famous uh, painting, maybe it's not very clear, but there is a compass used. There are artifacts which are symbolic artifacts. Formulas. You say this is a piece of map. There is a lot of artifacts. Each of these symbols were created, produced, conceived by human beings in order to express particular uh, ideas. A few, years, a few days ago, I was discussing a very interesting project with one of you, and uh, came out the idea of represent, plain representation of complex numbers. Uh, so it, this was a very, so the notion of complex numbers uh, is a very complicated one. And, uh, but as soon as somebody conceived a particular representation of this in terms of the plane, point on the plane, this changed completely the way of thinking of this uh, idea of number and there was a development of this notion. So artifacts are certainly related to mathematics and are related to do a lot of mathematics. For instance, new technologies are the have a great, uh, they gave a great contribution to the development of new mathematics. So the origin and development of mathematics knowledge very often can find in, can be found in the use of an art. The case of the abacus is well known. In fact, the use of the abacus is very, very dates very long time ago, but the positional notation that comes exactly from the use of the numbers, because the representation of the number, we will talk about the abacus later, so but the representation of the, of the number in the abacus is the, uh, the origin of the writing a number according to a positional notation. So the positional notation can be considered as the mathematics produced after the use of the abacus. This is well known, probably. The second one is probably not so well known. This is a prospectograph. The prospectograph is a nice device. This is very nice, but there are others that are not so nice. But in any case, functioning in a very effective way and uh, uh, different um, different devices have different ways <coughs> used but the, what is the uh, the task that this artifact can help us to accomplish painting painting in perspective was done by using this artifact you put an eye here and in this way you can follow the border of this object on this screen. But what is interesting is not so much the fact that the painters were using these artifacts. They were not just painting in perspective in a, for intuition. They were painting using this artifact because they wanted to reproduce in a verosimile can I translate very similarly? Like the, the, in a truth way, what could be seen? This was the intention of the painter of his perspective. And this was very, very useful for that. But what is not known is that projected geometry is exactly a derivation originates from the use of this device and from the manuals that were developed in order to explain how it functions and also to develop, to explain how and why 
this was function, functioning properly. So from how and why came out the theory. It's enough to think that this plane is no more vertical but can go up and down and, and you will see a projective transformation. This is much more for mathematicians. But, but what is interesting is the fact that is not as usually we think that in a certain technology we incorporate a certain knowledge. What is interesting, what comes from history, is the fact that there is the inverse process. Technology and the use of that certain technology produce as a, a derivation the production of a theoretical set of axioms and uh, theorems, and so on, so to mathematics. So this was something that suggested us a particular way to look at artifact, generally speaking. So the challenge for math education is that of studying how is it possible to exploit the complex relationship between the use of an artifact and the mathematical the mathematics that I wouldn't say that is incorporated. No, because if you think in terms of the mathematics is historical terms, it's, the mathematics is not yet there. But but it's, for me it's more pro say the mathematics that is evoked by its use is evoked to who? To an expert. So for the for the students the mathematics is not yet there. For the students, there is a certain device. They can use it and can produce solution to a task or whatever. For the person who look, which is a spec, who is an expert, and looks at these activities, there is a mathematics, which is a vote. If I look at young child using a perspectograph, I know that there is projective geometry behind that. But the students just use it. Is it clear? Because this, I think, is a very crucial point. So we wanted to reverse this idea that we use an artifact because it has a certain mathematics incorporated. Rather, we want to use the artifact because it was able to evoke a certain mathematical meaning. However, the complexity of the relationship between <coughs> mathematics evoked and the use of the artifact is not is something that requires a very very thoughtful analysis. And to make an artifact become a real opportunity for teaching and learning needs a very careful analysis. And so we, we took, we accepted the challenge. And we took a Vygotskian perspective and we elaborated a theoretical frame and this is the theoretical frame of semiotic mediation. We want to uh, start with historic, if it is possible, asserting an epistemological and a cognitive analysis and we want to carry out this without thinking differently from old and new technology. We want to have a, a frame which can be used for both old and new technologies. Of course, there is a difference. In the case of old technology, history can give us some hints how to exploit the potentialities of its use. Because we have the history already given us a perspective where to go. For new technology, I think that it could be an obstacle to think only in terms of the design of this technology. I give you an example, uh, taken from the case of dynamic geometry systems. Everybody knows who has seen at least once the functioning of these devices that they were designed with the objective of 
teaching and learning geometry. So the, the main ideas were to uh, the use of these devices should develop idea, geometrical ideas. So as a matter of fact, a careful analysis can show us other potentialities, not directly direct related to geometry. I give you an example for those who know. This is the reason why I didn't choose this example for everyone. As a main example, because maybe, maybe some of you don't know the uh, functioning of dynamic geometry. In dynamic geometry, there are points moving. Okay, this is obvious. What is more subtle is the fact that not all these points move equally. There is there are different ways of movement. And movements are functionally related. I can move one point, and this movement, movement make another point move. And this is the core of the net. But this also is something related to the very idea of function. Because function is a correlation between variables. And what is best of a point moving to have an idea of what is a variable? So we exploited this potentiality, which was not the poten specifically the, uh, the idea of the design to exploit the idea of function using a DGS. But analyzing the functioning, and analyzing how you act on this elements in, a, in this device, we could uh, detect a very interesting epistemology of which was evoked, which is the idea of function. So I said Vygotsky. Which are the main aspects of Vygotsky that we used? Uh, the key notion that we used are the zone of, of proximal development. This is a very, very nice but very rarely operative uh, idea because it's, uh, it's usually is described by Vygotsky in a very uh, suggest, I don't know uh, suggests something but not clearly what we took from this we took a very specific element the fact that in this zone what is assumed is that there are different roles of the agents that take place in this activity. And specifically, there is one agent, could be a teacher or another peer, which is more expert than the other. So there is a, a basic asymmetry in the roles. And this was the element that we took. The second key element is the process of Internalization, internalization. And are two elements of this process that are interesting for us. One is the fact that, according to the Vygotskyan hypothesis, the process of internalization is essentially social. And because it's social, it's based on communication, broadly in them, this idea of communication. And because of communication, we have this semiotic dimension, and in particular, production and interpretation of sounds. The other key idea is the idea of semiotic mediation, but we elaborated this. Uh, we have no time to discuss how we used the Vygotskyan idea. It's important to say that our elaboration is different from what Vygotsky says. So I think that uh, we would, need, would be necessary a whole seminar about discussing the difference between how we use the uh, Vygotskyan idea. I don't think it's important now, but uh, I want to stress that if anybody feels that how we use the idea of mediation is a little bit different from what he or she thought about in Vygotskyan terms, I, I'm sure that the 
the person is right, because it's not exactly the same. However, I'll try to explain how we intend mediation. And I need a, a very short digression. There are at least two, at least, there is a lot of meanings for mediation. There is a lot of definition about mediation. But I want to make clear how I use it. There are, in our frame, there are two kinds of mediation. One is related to the use of a particular device, a particular artifact. And the goal is to accomplish a task. I give you an example. I can use a hammer just to uh, put a nail in the wall. So the hammer is a, an artifact, and there is a mediation of the hammer that makes me accomplish the task to put the nail in the wall. But there is another way to use the word mediation, and this is very, very often used in the math education field, and refer to the fact that there is a mediation of a particular piece of knowledge, a mediation of a content, a mediation of mathematical ideas, or something like that. So these two are completely different. We will focus on this, but certainly we take into account this, because mediation in terms of makes pupils to appropriate of a particular knowledge will be related to pupils using a particular artifact in order to accomplish a particular task. So the complexity of the, this term, mediation, comes from the fact that uh, there is a sort of ambiguity in the use of this term when we want to use it to refer to, a con to a the accomplishment of a task and when we want to refer to it to the appropriation of mathematical knowledge. I give you another example. Take the case of a compass. You can use a compass just to draw a circle if your task is to draw a nice circle, you could also use a glass. You put a glass, you draw a circle. If you are a, a teacher and your objective is to teach and to make the student appropriate of the definition of a circle as a locus of points equidistant from a fixed point, the center, I'm afraid that the two artifacts will not have the same potential. Because in the case of the glass, you will have a nice shape, but nobody will uh, realize that there is a center. If you have a compass, you have to point the compass and draw. And the fact that the compass doesn't change is the distance between the two legs and the fact that you point on the center will evoke the mathematical definition of a circle. So you see there is a task that is accomplished with something and there is the problem of appropriation of a mathematical knowledge. Drawing circles doesn't mean that you know the definition of a circle. So, to summarize, we have artifacts. A abacus, this is a, the sign of a DGS. There is a task. There is a mathematics which is evoked. There is two different planes. The plane of culture, where mathematics was produced and is shared in a certain community, which is, uh, in a sense, also a content that is to be taught. And there is the plane of the, of the pupils, where tasks are accomplished and pupils talk to each other, and there is a class, and there is the classroom community. So acting and uh, using an artifact to accomplish a task, there are certain meanings that are related to the mathematical meanings that are evoked. 
So we can see the artifact as relating both to the meanings emerging from its their the use, its use for the task and the meanings evolved in the mathematics. This double relationship between the meanings emerging from the task and the meanings evoked in the mathematics is what we call the semiotic potential. So a certain artifact, as an expert, I can look at it but from two points of view. One is the point of view of accomplishing a task and see what kind of meanings can emerge from this use. <coughs> And, as an expert, I can look at the mathematics that is evoked by this use. This relationship between these two th meanings we call semiotic potential. But there is another assumption I told you, the Vygotskian. Our assumption is that there are certain signs, because I was talking about meanings, but what is a meaning? There are no meanings if there are no signs. At least, here we can discuss. It depends on our way of looking at what happens in our mind. However, we cannot have any evidence of meaning emerging from a certain use of an artifact if we don't have any sign that is produced. And usually, when people do something, talk. And if we put a group of pupils around uh, accomplishing a task with a certain device, we will have students talking each other. And we will have a lot of words, gestures, drawings, and whatever you want to call a sign. And it's only looking at these signs that we can have an idea of what kind of meanings are emerging from the use of the artifact. But our assumption is that not only signs emerge, but they can be socially elaborated. In particular, they can be intentionally used by the teacher to exploit semiotic processes, aiming at guiding the evolution of meanings within the class community. So students talk about what they are doing, but the teacher, and the teacher, what is the difference? The, di the difference is that the teacher has a goal, and the teacher knows the potentiality of the artifact, and can recognize in the sign sprouting from the, the activity, the possibility to be transformed, to develop into mathematical science. So, in our model, there is a lot of semiotic activities that are asked. We are not only asked to pupils to talk each other, but we ask them to, to draw, to uh, ask them to write, we ask them to produce a lot of text. These are situated texts, in the sense that they are strictly related to the activity, are strictly related to the fact that they are accomplishing a certain task with a certain artifact. But because we are experts and we can look through, we can also refer this situated text to mathematical text. You understand, it's not only a problem of changing words. It's not only the problem of changing one word in another word. We have to be sure that in this change, the meaning if I, I can also just call this nice shape a circle. But the fact that I call it a circle doesn't guarantee that this shape is a mathematical circle for the student. And I, ha I have made the students aware of the fact that for the circle there is a particular and specific definition which make it a mathematical object. So, if we don't do anything, is it probable that 
between these two planes, it can be a break, a gap. I like to express this gap with these figures. So this is the world of the task, of the art, of the, the world of the, of the students. And here is the world of the, of the teacher. And there is a gap. There is a gap because the students don't know that what they are doing is mathematics. Until I make them aware of the mathematics that is in, in the class. And this is exactly what the teacher has to do to act as an idiot. So on one side, of course, there is a problem of designing suitable tasks, but mainly because this could be done also done by a researcher. We can design beautiful sequences, then we give this sequence to the sequence to the, to the teacher, but a sequence of tasks doesn't solve the educational problem because because what is necessary is that the guide in the evolution of the sign. And when I say sign, I repeat, is not only substitute one word with another word, it is substituting one word, maybe with the same word, but with a different meaning, which is the mathematical meaning. Okay, the evolution of sign is our uh, core. And uh, the teacher can intentionally exploit the semiotic potential of an artifact to foster the evolution of personal sign. This is another expression that we like, comes from Leontiel, to mathematical sign. I, I find this expression personal sign very effective to uh, stress the two perspectives uh, that makes uh, the sense gives the sense of uh, the word sign because a sign is something that stands for something else for somebody in a certain respect. This is a way to define sign, one of the possible reformulation of Peel's definition, which in my view is very important because something for, which stands for something else is okay. <coughs> But it's important that this relation is from the point of view of some, someone, not for everybody, which is a personal relationship. And the other part is important too, a sign never captures the whole meaning <coughs> of a certain word. So the teacher has to plan teaching sequences centered on the use of the artifact, but is not enough, so we define what we call the didactic cycle. And we imagine a sort of spiral of these cycles. Activities with the artifact, production of science, and mainly collective production of science, and basically on what we call the mathematical discussion, which is a particular discussion with this clear objective on developing mathematical science. So, if we want to uh, study huh, uh, this model and uh, we want to have consistent teaching experiment, we need uh, we, we have in front of us different directions of investigation. We have a lot, but mainly two. The first one, which is the easiest in my view, is that of make a semiotic analysis uh, of the potential of an art. Of an art. And then, this, of course, you can't uh, start a teaching experiment on this model if you don't have an artifact and you decide what kind of task and so on and so on. But there is another direction, which in my view it's very, very, the most difficult, is how to analyze the process of semiotic mediation. How to analyze the unfolding of the semiotic potential. How we can observe that what we foresee about the use of the artifact really happens. So what the, 
we have to look. We have to look at what the students say, what the students draw, what the students produce. But mainly, we have also to see how the evolution takes place. And this is really very difficult. And it's also very difficult to show evidences to the others. So it was very challenging when I decided to do that. Because uh, this is, in a sense, a, a priori analysis, and this is an a posteriori analysis, when we have data collected. So a priori is always much, much easier than a posteriori analysis. And if we don't um, prepare very well our categories of observation, it would be very, very difficult to carry out the a posteriori analysis. Okay, I know there are certain methods which I don't like so much that just look at what is there and then classify. Okay, can I be a little bit polemic on that? Just a few seconds. Uh, this seems to me a sort of Sisyphal work. I don't know if you know the, the myth of Sisyphal. Sisyphal was the man who was obliged to bring a stone to the top of a hill. And when he reached the top, he threw away the, the stone and start again. So, 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 so. so this kind of method, that's, you have a lot of data. I say, oh, I try to make sense of it. I try to set up a, a nice classification of my team. And usually, you are successful because you, if you look at this data, some Easy. No, it's not always easy, but it, it can be done. But the problem in my problem is, for what? Classifying is not an experience in itself. It's not something, maybe it's something that makes you feel happy. <laughs> but after a while, you are like Sisyphus, because you have another, another bunch of, of data, and you start again with another classification. Maybe the previous one doesn't fit very well because it was very good for this, not for the other. Or more often, another research collects another collection of data and makes another classification. Of course, I'm a good lady and I review it a lot of papers and I review it a lot of classification, not related to each other. And this is really, for me, a waste of intelligence. You must know what you want to look at. Decide your tools. Be very flexible in the sense if it's not effective, you will change everything you throw away. But if you don't have something clear in advance, most of the time your collection of data will be completely mute. End of the polemic. <laughs> Uh, so, semiotic potential, all technology. Uh, what I choose? I choose the abacus. I was sure that everybody knew. Hmm? So, this one maybe nobody know, but this one is the, the Roman abacus. And maybe you don't recognize the abacus here, which is very nice, because this is a, an illustration in is the beginning of the 16th century, 15, or three or something like that. Mm -hmm. And this is an illustration of the fight between new people that uh, wanted to, to use the new technology, the abacus, and the others who wanted to maintain the calculation made with uh, uncraft or uh, same craft uh, uh, symbols. The, this, the, this fight lasted a lot because it, it takes long to, to see the, uh, how powerful was the use of the apples. But certainly it was very clear for people in the, in the business. So this was a very good uh, way to uh, develop the use of the apples. However, the history is very nice. You can read the history of the abacus. But what is important for me is to see the, uh, some aspect of the semiotic potential and follow a little bit the evolution in the working in a classroom. 
So, the potential. This is my favorite. This is a pasta abacus. Uh, this is made with a, a particular pasta, which is uh, made as a veal, as a hole in, in the middle, so it can be easily put in the, in the veal. So, of course, uh, any abacus is good. What is not good is an abacus with different colors. Think about that. Think of the different potential, semiotic potential, of an abacus with beads of the same type, all of them of the same type, and abacus with beads of different colors. It seems easier to use with different colors, but for the development of the meanings, mathematical meanings that we want to develop, is much worse. And we will, I hope that at the end this will be clear. So what, what is the potential, what are the potentiality of the abacus? First of all, the abacus is a device to represent. So it's something that may be conceived from the mathematical point of view as a device for representing a number. I showed you the, this picture before just to show you that there were two different ways of representing numbers and working on these two different representations and people were fighting about which of these two representations was the best for solving their problems. Okay? So now, our idea is to develop this idea, through the use of the abacus, to develop the idea of representing a number. And specifically, representing a number according to the position notation. Of course, now, to many of us, it uh, seems obvious, but it's not obvious. For many students, it's really difficult, and it's exactly a, an achievement of, I would say, third, second year of the primary school. So, acting with the abacus, in, uh, putting beads in, in the veer, and uh, changing, uh, we can represent numbers. Of course, which is the convention. The convention is that in this year, you can't put more than nine bits. Acting on representation of numbers, for instance, counting, and also relating representation, different representation of numbers. Um, this, the use of the abacus can be understood uh, very well if we compare it with uh, the use of sticks. Uh, the use of sticks, I show you, I can tie a bundle of sticks of that. This is the same as the same mathematically. Is the same of thinking of a bead that counts for 10. But where is the difference? There is a, a great difference. Because in the case of a bundle, you can just tie and tie, tie and tie. So the semiotic potential of a bundle comes from the fact that a bundle can be a unity and a group at the same time. And you can't forget, because you are, are always there, this double meaning. In the case of the abacus, this is not possible. You have to appropriate of the convention that one bead, according to the position, has a different value. So, we have the position annotation, we have a task, for instance, the task that we will analyze in a minute is the task represent 15, and we have personal meanings related to grouping beads, uh, maybe referring to the use of the stick if they already use them. Then, uh, a bead may represent a group, and they can focus on the position because at a certain point, 
there will be, for instance, a discussion if putting one bit on the left and five bits on the right, is it the same to put, to put one bit on the right and five on the left? The, the goal is representing number according to the position of you see that decimal, decimal is only one option. Okay, uh, I would like to go f a little bit faster in order to, to show you some examples. Okay. First of all, I want to give you a certain uh, hint about the classification of signs. We di divided between signs related to the artifact, and we call them artifact signs, it means that the meaning is related to the use of the art. And the mathematical signs, obviously, are related to mathematics. What is not so obvious is the third class. It's the class that, of sign that we, ca we call pivot sign. This is related to the dynamics of the evolution. These signs, they have a particular polysemy and they are used to construct uh, links between personal science and eventually links to the mathematical science. Where is the where stay the polysemy? The polysemy is that certain words may have both a meaning a ter in terms of the artifact and may have a meaning in terms of mathematics. Some of them can be so neutral an example which is very clear is the use of gestures that are deitic. I think it's the deitic is clear. This. Uh, this is a very ambiguous term because can be referred both to the particular thing that you have, but also can be referred to the mathematical idea if for somebody it makes sense. And in a class, you have a lot of these neutral signs. What is interesting is to see if they function as a pivot, if they function to make the evolution progress. OK, the role of the teacher. The main role of the teacher is to design and manage, we say, orchestrate. Here, again, there is a lot of different use of the word orchestration, of the mathematical discussion. And in particular, I like to put this because uh, Marjolina will be happy, what is the introduction of the voice of, there is only one, voice of the mathematical culture. Hmm? What does it mean? Uh, the expert and the mathematics and uh, the teacher is the guiding person. So during the process of semiotic mediation, there is a general goal, fostering the emergence of pupils' personal science and guiding the evolution towards the mathematical science. And two types of specific goals, the social construction of shared science <coughs> and the evolution of this science towards the mathematical science. So the analysis of the, the teacher's action can be articulated according to these goals. So we can try to classify what or to analyze what the teacher does in terms of the goals that can be identified in this action. So the example, there is an antifact. Students have built their abacus and they have discussed possible uses. Uh, they are aware of the constraints and also they referred to the experience to the different bundles, bunches of sticks that they used before. The first task is what's the abacus for? <coughs> Let's uh, the conversation. Let's see the conversation. To count, to learn numbers, to put bits on inside 
I, I just literally translate them inside the sticks. It's not very accurate. <coughs> oh, there. First, first, no, at the beginning of the second year, of, second, seven, six, seven years old. <coughs> the teacher. And to put the sticks inside the sticks, what is it for? So after we have struck them, we understand the numbers back. What do you think, Tommy, means to understand the numbers better? <laughs> Why we understand them better? Number. Because we count them. Or because we see how many are on the average. Okay. We see a lot of words there, at least, if we just... Uh, stay on words. The first three interventions, for instance, they don't have the same focus. Certainly, Manuel is already on a little bit more uh, on the side of mathematics. He used a mathematical word, count. The other want to please a little bit the teacher and say, oh, so you, there is for learning numbers. However, she understood that it's related to mathematics. Look at, at Tommaso. Tommaso stayed on the task. What is the abacus? Is to put bits. In this sense, these put bits inside the sticks is exactly artifact science. In no way, pure because there is no reference to mathematics. Uh, the teachers. The teachers mirrors, hmm, rephrase, doesn't rephrase. She says the same phrase. We, we usually use mirror. Mirror Tomaso. Put the beads inside the sticks. What is it for? You see, now she is trying, asking for interpreting what is said. And firstly, she asked Tommaso to interpret. But he could also ask everyone to interpret. It's a way to focus on a particular element coming out, a particular text, a particular sign, in order to make them evolve. Let's see if there is a certain evolution. You see, after we have strung them, we understand the numbers better. Maybe it is just echoing, makes the echo of learn the numbers of Martin. Maybe. But certainly, Tommaso uh, relate his phrase to another phrase. This is a, a step of what we could call a semiotic chain because he's trying to elaborate on the previous expression. Now she opened the discussion, trying to make the other, uh, so to say, uh, explain the, what Tommy. And Manuel comes back to count, and Ricardo, we didn't talk before, we see how many are on the arms. The important element is C, because C refers to look at what appears, and this could be a good uh, element to, uh, to which the teacher can inch, because the goal is to throw the students towards the mathematical idea of representing. It means making something appear to be seen as something else. So maybe equal C could be a pilot word, a pilot sound. Maybe. We don't have the other part of this conversation, so we can't say if this was really effective in, in the development. So uh, I want to conclude. Yeah? 
But I want to show another uh, piece, very short. I want to show this because it's one of my favorite about. You know. This is what uh, students, uh, what is the abacus for? So they talked about that. And then they were asked to write. And one wrote that. The drawing and the terms serve to form a number, with also the units. In one term, there are 10 units, even. It is pregnant. The abacus has wires with 10 bits on and units. I like this is not only because the, the metaphor is very nice, but also because uh, there is a, a nice uh, chain, semiotic chain. Uh, you see, is using the metaphor of one bit hides ten other bits and draw this idea, express this as a super bit with ten bits inside, hidden. Maybe this drawing suggests the idea of a bead with a big belly with all these beads inside. It's a way we express things metaphorically. So the first metaphor is hidden. And this maybe was used in the, in, the, in the classroom. Because this is a very common way to express the fact that one bead counts for 10. And say, OK, in this, there are other, and you can untie the, the, the bundle, but you can uh, substitute one bit with all the bits that it has hidden inside. But probably this drawing suggested this other method. This is an, an interpretation. But I wanted to show you how signs, sprouting, can be related and can be uh, in a dynamic Okay, they just do all this 15, and I want to show the, no, no, no. the discussion. So, collect the, the results, collect the, the different solution, and then open the, the discussion. Why did you represent, most of them represented in this way? So, she tried to make them, make explicit the strategy. Why did you represent the number 15 like that? Like that means one bit on the tens and five bits in, in the units. Correct. Uh, why did you put one bit in one of the wires and five on the other? Martina, I look at 15, I tried, and I counted. The teacher, if you count, and points to the abacus. The beads are six, actually six. But the number represented on the abacus is 15. Anybody would like to try explaining how she did? Julia. This is the 10, and she points to the wire on the left. And these are the units, and she points to the five bits on the wire on the left. The teacher. Julia says that in the wire on the left, there is the 10 bit. 10 bit is a particular word, as you probably saw in the previous protocol. This guy was using 10 bit. And in Italian, it is pallina decina. Pallina is bit, small dog, decina is 10. And this is a word that was used and shared in and the, the teacher used this. Why in the wire on the right there are, and the cones says, units. <laughs> effect, if the French people would say that this is a, an effect of pass. For who, who knows the effect of pass. However, the first uh, analysis, I can, you see the color? So the blue is mathematics. The red is artifact. 
The green is the fine ones. You see, represent is something that for the students has no meaning, mathematical meaning at this point, but has a, in, the, in the common language represent as a meaning. So it can be used by the teacher in a way that is understandable for the students, and also there is an echo of the mathematical meaning. I just focus on count because both Martina and the teacher use this word which is a mathematical sign. But the interpretation given by the teacher, I would say, is a literal counting. In the sense that she wants to provoke a contradiction. She wants to provoke a conflict. And she interprets the word used by Martina in a mathematical way, but literally, just counting the beats. And this is the reason why it's so important that beats are of the same color. Because this game is much more effective if the beat is no, of a different color. And of course, there are six beats. But of course, it's not. This, the, the counting, the, the word counting doesn't mean that. The other point is that there is this is the ten, and immediately after the teacher rephrase, this is in the wire on the left, which is still an artifact sign, but is much more explicit and can be related to uh, something which is in between. <laughs> Uh, is not completely mathematics, is not yet mathematics, is still related to the artifact and can will, will be one of the elements to make uh, the uh, chain evolve. But where, is the act, where are the action of the teacher? At the very beginning, there is a sort of going back to the task and asking people to remember what they were doing and remembering what they how they express this. And Martina is describing exactly what she was doing. Then the second point, there is a sort of, uh, in the mirroring, there is a focalization. What does it mean? The, the, the teacher wants to uh, bring the attention of the students on a particular aspect. The, the beats are counted, but this counting is a very special one. Behind this, there is a grouping, not only a count. Thus, students concentrate on this game about counting beats and representing. But immediately after, she tries to synthesize. First, she asks to synthesize. And after the attempt of Julia of synthesis, the teachers again provides another synthesis, which is a, a little bit far. So, what uh, what we can see in the in the sequence and uh, afterwards. There is a, another attempt of the teacher of synthesizing, and a new element, a new sign is introduced, and is the word form. And what is nice is to see how this word comes after in the different. And this is what we call a semiotic change. And the, the, the meaning of this word uh, change a little bit during this. So today we understand the octopus is formed of two wires. The wire on the right is that of the human, the wire on the left is the The number 15 is formed, so the octopus is formed, but also the number is formed. So the, the, this idea of form be formed uh, is related to the fact that uh, is a way of representing one ten and five units. One ten and 
by units. Thus, the wire of the tens will put only one D, and the wire of the units will five. The intervention of Sabina is interesting because she is following, and she gives another explanation according to what she did, which is different. And he said, on the contrary, I started from the B. I saw that 15 is formed by 1 and 5. I looked at it, and then I thought to form the number in this way. But you see that she is reusing this, that were introduced by the teacher in the previous sentences. In the last uh, intervention, the, the word form is substituted by another title, which is written. And this open to what will be done later to talk more explicitly about the representation. Uh, I will stop here. If somebody wants to have the classification of the task, which are the tasks, uh, the, sorry, uh, the action of the teacher, back to the task, focalization, ask for a synthesis, and provide a synthesis. This I show you, and can be defined according to the objective. We want to provoke students to talk and uh, produce we want them to construct, to construct a shared context. Because in order to share the meanings, we have to share the context. And uh, focalization. We have a lot of signs. The teacher has to focus in order to make a chain, a uh, semiotic chain. And finally, we, she asked for a synthesis because she wants to support students in decontextualizing and generalizing. If I ask you, OK, what did you understand of what uh, I said today? Ah, you can't start at the beginning and say, oh, you started with this sentence and this other sentence. Maybe you say, I didn't understand anything. That's true. But certainly, you have to capture some key elements and find something which is no more related to the, uh, no more a narrative of what happens, but it's much more related to uh, a general idea of what happens. So uh, sometimes asking for a generalization, decontextualization is too difficult for the students, and many times uh, the, the teacher has to provide as a, a, a synthesis. I know that it's uh, very difficult to give the whole idea, but I think that we need all the pieces. Otherwise, it's difficult to understand even, I think it was not easy for you to follow my analysis of, the, of this excerpt. But uh, I think also this is a problem with this kind of studies. If you want to study collective discussions, it becomes a nightmare to write a paper. Uh, but this uh, must can be it prevent you to to study this. But I think that we have to find a way to share results about this kind of data, even if these data are so complicated to be managed. There are, they are. I, I don't think that it's only because I was not so clever. But I think it's, uh, there is an intrinsic difficulty to this kind of analysis. But I don't think that this difficulty is a good excuse not to do it. So thank you very much. We have time for a few questions. Just for the synthesis. <laughs> no, I'm joking. Okay. I, I, I have a question about how, where in this uh, in this world, in this theoretical world, where do you identify the the knowledge that students initially bring when they start working 
with the with the artifacts. And I know that in semiotic analysis, as Charles Peirce did with the triangles, it's a triangle and a triangle and a triangle and, a triangle and never ending. <laughs> yeah, this is good. But uh, if you want to speak but about, but it's, it's very effective in this case because yeah. as you, what you see is exactly this idea of uh, continuous interpretation. Yeah. Because a, a word uh, is used in a, in, in a phrase, and then you have another phrase, and then you have another phrase, right? and the chain, the, the idea of semiotic chain is exactly related to that. Uh, I don't think that we have to really identify what the students already do. Of course, we, we can do it. But um, when we start, we assume that they already know something. Hmm? Like counting? Maybe counting, yes. But it should come out in this uh, discourse. And the problem of the teacher is exactly not to uh, constrain uh, too quickly the students towards the specific use of the word, but leave them free. For instance, if you uh, do things in, in, a, in, a, in a correct way, everybody should say how they did. So we saw only one. But actually what happens is everyone has to explain. And this is the idea of back to the task. It, when it means that the, the teacher asks to come back to the task and try to say how they solve the task. In this way, the students will express what they did by signs. This is the emergence of personal signs. And uh, I don't think we care, we must care, the teacher must care too much to detect which are the single meanings. What is important is that these meanings interact and find a way to understand each other. And this is exactly what, what do you think, I'm sorry you don't say, uh, what do you think Tommy wanted to say? This is a classic uh, intervention asking for interpreting and is, it, is, it, is this process of interpretation that makes really the sharing of the meanings? Because uh, I can think that I understand you only because I'm interpreting your word in my, according to my ideas, my conception, but maybe you wanted to say completely different things. It's trying to talk each other and try to explain what I think that you wanted to say that really sharing comes out. So sharing and making all these personal meaning come out is the very beginning. Of course, it comes out a lot of things, and sometimes many things that are not related at all to the goal of the teacher. And this is the reason of organization. So this teacher in this huge uh, flourishing of text, she has to try to find uh, something to bring the attention of the, of the students. So in this case, for instance, the teacher selected this idea of count because he saw the possibility of uh, generating a conflict, but also try to make the interpretation of counting uh, shared and deeper. This is the, the idea of focalization. I don't know if I answer to your, to your question, but for people who heard for the first time, because this is the problem. <laughs> I'm telling this story many times, but maybe there is some of you that does it make sense? I'm curious, like, what was the duration? Like, when you did, like, case studies, what was, like, usually the duration of these lessons? Was it over several days or oh, weeks? Is, or? This is a lesson in a school year. Okay. And uh, it's, the sequence is uh, very long. OK. And is it, is it, the idea is that of the teaching experiment. Usually, 
we, we call indigenous value and something that is inspired by a certain frame and uh, you have the design and then also you, what you observe and you analyze is according to, the, to this frame. And there is a very long, long, long term. This is the other, point. these processes cannot be achieved in one hour. I don't think that we can learn and teach anything in one hour. Of course, we can. If I, if I, I want you to learn my address, maybe, or my telephone number, maybe three minutes are more than sufficient. But uh, this idea is, I, this idea also the uh, cycle is a spiral. Mm -hmm. And there are other actions that I didn't put here too complicated and related to the time. Because many times here we saw the use of, of a word that was shared before. And uh, in the, the effect of this is related to the previous use of this word. So the time and the explicit reference to time. We will see tomorrow or we will see next week or do you remember what we did last week? These are very important because uh, still this idea of uh, making uh, a certain, I call it context, but I feel that for instance, for those who are familiar with the concept, the idea, the French idea of milieu is the most uh, uh, suitable for that. Uh, because in order to uh, make this evolution start, the, the community has to share a certain milieu, which is much more than context, which is uh, broader. It's something that is related to uh, common experiences, common way of talking, which is something that is related to the fact that this is only one episode in a long-term uh, story. Uh, of course, this is a, a model which needs a long term. You're right. But I don't think that still education can be achieved so quickly. And talking is so crucial in a classroom. If we don't, this is a very particular perspective on looking at the discourse. A lot of people uh, work and study the discourse. This is a very specific one. It's relating the analysis of the discourse to the fact that we are providing students the experience with an artifact and want to look how this use of the artifact may produce a certain mathematical meaning. Explicit, I stress. I'm not happy with thinking that if they do something, they know something that I call magnetics. This is a very peculiar epistemological step. Huh? My personal. Hmm? But personal also in the sense of my own appreciate. Have you made any sense with computational artifacts? Yes, yes, a lot. Actually, this is not one of my studies. But uh, uh, my study on, on com computer <laughs> software, uh, maybe on uh, the dynamic geometry. Uh, what I did uh, was using dynamic geometry essentially for two mathematical meanings. One is the meaning, the sense, of, call it more the sense of proof, and uh, so introducing students to proof, and specifically to theorems. It means uh, not proof in itself, because it doesn't exist, but to the idea of theorems. There is a theory, there is a statement, uh, and a proof that is a proof in the theorem. So this is a very complex mathematical meaning, and uh, we used uh, the DGS in order to introduce that. Uh, the other was, uh, for algebra, uh, make sense of manipulation, algebraic manipulation, uh, using a particular software where the properties of 
uh, operations were well fine, objectified in commands. And manipulation was uh, at the counterpart in a, in a sequence of commands. So manipulation is more like a formal derivation. The other mathematical, there is a lot of other things. The other was some function and graph, still in a DGS. I use a spreadsheet for variables and uh, expressions. So, oh, now we are using a combination of two artifacts. Manipulative is paper and prints, and uh, digital, which is uh, Dynamic, dynamic geometry uh, and uh, the mathematics is symmetry for primary school students. Long term, masses, uh, a lot of conversation to analyze. I believe we've arrived at the end of the formal time, and Professor Marat will still be with us for a while, I don't know, a few weeks. Uh, unfortunately, I'm leaving on Sunday. Should be until uh, Sunday. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, I will be back on, on, on April okay. day for okay. a couple of weeks. Thank you so very much for sharing your research with us today. Oh, thank you for watching.